Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Perfect. I flew a long way to get here, so give me lots of energy. <laughs> My name is Donovan Brown. I'm a principal DevOps manager at Microsoft. What we're going to be talking about today is DevOps. And at Microsoft, we define DevOps as this. DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. This is what we try to do every single day. And because we're a developer company writing tools for developers, we have to do this and enable you to do the exact same thing. I'm a firm believer that if you implement DevOps, it's going to allow your company to move faster than it's ever moved before, to be able to displace your competition. I recently found a video that I think really shows off what your company could look like before it implements DevOps and what your company could look like after it implements DevOps. I want to share that video with you right now. It's coming out of here. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work yeah, it's this cable, yeah? It's the tenth time. Colin stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. I don't know. Can you hear it when we turn up my head? Nobody move. Changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stopped. When I saw this video, I thought to myself, that that's what DevOps is about. And I'm very, very active on Twitter, so if you use Twitter, it's the best way to get a hold of me. And I tweeted that video. And I said, DevOps before and after. And most people got it. But a couple people said there was no value in the second pit stop at all. Like, I don't, how, what do you mean there's no value? There were so many more people, of course it was faster than the first time. I'm like, well, I think you're kind of missing the point. The other person said, they didn't refuel the car. Right? They didn't add any value at all in the second pit stop. I'm thinking, this is insane. Like, how do you think this? So I'm upstairs reading this, and my wife comes in. She's like, what's wrong with you? Because I'm like clearly upset that people don't get it. <laughs> She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, they don't understand. I mean, they don't get that this is so much more value. I said, I think I'm going to write a blog post. She said, yeah, you should write a blog post. So I'm all amped up. I'm typing fiercely writing this big blog post. But what I'm going to do with you now is I'm going to share with you my insights on these two items here. Let's first talk about the fact that there's more people. How many of you remember compact computers? Anyone remember compact? All the old people, right? <laughs> yeah. That's where I started. Back in 1996, I started writing software for compact computers. That was a time when I, as the developer, when I was done writing the software, I went into the server room. And I logged into the production server, and I copied files wherever I wanted to copy files. I changed the registry, I stopped services, I start services. When I was done, only my software worked. No one else's software worked anymore, right? But it was just me and the computer. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there were a lot less people involved in deploying software. Try that today, right? You'll, get, you'll lose your job. Because the ops person has to be involved, QA has to be involved, program management has to be involved, auditors have to be involved. There are so many more people involved in deploying software today than ever before. So that picture is a perfect analogy for what it was 20 years ago and what it looks like today. What I thought was really interesting though, is that when I saw all those different individuals there, I didn't see them as people. I saw them as automation. Because there's a lots of things that happen to deploy software. 
the commit to the repository, the continuous integration, the automated testing, the infrastructure as code, the configuration as code, the automatic deployment, the monitoring in production. That's what I saw there. Just all these microservices, all these little things that we do that we string together to allow us to move faster than we've ever moved before. So to me, they weren't people. They were automation and key techniques that we have to apply to implement DevOps. So the more I watched it, the more I thought that made sense to me. Now, they didn't refill the car. Does anyone in this room think that if that car was empty that they wouldn't have put fuel in it? If you think that they didn't refill the car was a mistake, you're missing the whole point. The fact is they did not have to refill the car. They were able to get that car to go further on less fuel such that they did not have to refill it at all. That is the point. They shifted left. How many of you remember, well, if, you're, if you remember Compaq, you remember writing software and not writing unit tests. We all remember those days, the glory days, right? <laughs> you just wrote code and threw it over the fence to somebody else, right? And then you waited for them to find the bugs, log the bugs, and they would just come pouring down on top of you like a waterfall, just bug after bug after bug, and then you would go and fix the bugs, right? Well, the thing is, is that what if I wrote unit tests first? The code that I give to my QA team is higher quality. That code will go further with less bugs in it. Same thing here. If we make the car more efficient, it can go further on less fuel. So they shifted left all this cool technology. Another thing that I'm a firm believer in is that you fix what hurts most first. Look at this pit stop. Fueling the car wasn't the part that hurt the most. They were done fueling the car halfway through. The other 37 seconds was changing the other tire, of which they only changed two. But in the second pit stop, they changed all four of them. But they did not have to refill the car. So in my mind, what I see happening in this world is they're looking at the tire change and like, we've got to fix that. So they do. And then all of a sudden, they realize, wow, now we're spending 30 seconds filling a car. Because our tires have been changed for the last three seconds. Why are we waiting on this fuel? What can we do to get rid of this part of the problem? So you don't necessarily fix it first. You fix what hurts most first. And what hurt most was changing those tires. Once you figure out how to change the tires fast, all of a sudden, 37 seconds to fuel the car, that's too long. Let's go fix that now. That's exactly what we did inside of Microsoft. We fixed the most painful thing first, and then we saw something else, and we went and we fixed that. Too many people try to go fix everything at once. Or they go try to fix the little stuff first. Let's get some quick wins that don't change the overall delivery time at all. Right? If you have a four-day QA cycle, and then you go and fix the thing that only takes you 15 minutes anyway, you still are going to be four days away from shipping because you didn't fix what hurts the most, right? What you want to do is you want to worry about getting rid of the old stuff so that you can do this. So that you can take your code from the fingertips of your developers and put it into the hands of your users instantly. We want to continuously deliver value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you how we did that internally on the Visual Studio Team Services team. I know I'm up here representing Microsoft, but what I'm about to tell you only applies to the Visual Studio Team Services team. Not Windows, not Bing, not Office, not Xbox. They are all on their own DevOps transformations, but we're all at different stages. So that's why I don't want you to think that Windows is about to do what I'm about to say, because Windows is not there yet, but they're coming. Okay? So how did we do it at Microsoft for the VSTS team? The reason that I say that is I'm going to say we a lot. But when I say we, I mean this one specific team. Okay? The goal was to take Team Foundation Server from a three-year release cycle to releasing it as fast as we possibly can. How many of you remember TFS 2005? Just a couple of you. Sorry about that. It, it, it was rough. I know. You're brave. So I think more of you had it. You just were too embarrassed to raise your hands. It was that hard to use. It was my job to fly around the world and install that product. That's how complicated that product was when it first came out. I had to fly around, install it, and help people implement it. Funny thing is, is it called TFS 2005, but a little trivia for you, it didn't ship until 2006. Why? Because we were a waterfall. And we knew that if we coded for 18 months, we'd be done in time to go ahead and ship it. But it took us another 18 months of testing before you could even use the product. Now we're into February 2006. Why we didn't change the name to TFS 2006, I don't know. But we missed our date by over two months, right? And then what you'll notice is that we went away for about three years and came back and said, now we got it. 2008, mm, we nailed it. Nope. <laughs> no. 
You can't be gone for two years in the software industry and expect to know what's going to be happening two years from now. We don't have this crystal ball that told us that Jenkins was going to try to take over the world. Right? We didn't have this crystal ball that said Jira was going to go out there and rule the world when it came to work item tracking. We thought we were doing good. We put our heads in the sand. Two years later, we look up and we're like, holy crap, this looks like nothing like we expect. So we said, two years is too long. But one year? <laughs> one year, that's the sweet spot. No. <laughs> one year didn't work either. So what we did is we started shipping every three months. That gave us time to look at what our competition was doing, what the industry was doing, make changes, and start moving. But how do you go from a waterfall shop that shipped every three years to an agile shop that not only ships every three weeks on-prem, but this product team foundation server has a sister product called Visual Studio Team Services that ships every three weeks. From three years to three weeks. Took changing our people, changing our process, and changing our products. And we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. So, we are a completely agile shop. How many of you believe that you are agile? I phrase it, believe that you're agile, because I bet if I asked you some hard questions, you'd start saying no when you're supposed to be saying yes. We fixed that internally because we actually hired professionals to come into Microsoft and train everyone on our team. Too many of our customers send one poor person off to be Scrum Master trained, right? and they go and get blessed as a Scrum Master, this one person, and they got to come back into this organization that's been waterfall for 30 years and try to convince them to now be agile. And you fail, right? Because everyone wants to keep doing what they've always been doing. But what we did differently is we made sure that everyone was on the same page, scrum master, engineer, product manager, everyone, okay? So the way that we did that, we trained them and we also had support from the top, which is crucially important to be successful with DevOps and agile in particular. If your management doesn't get it, your underlings are never ever going to have a chance of being successful because they're going to want Gantt charts and milestones and ridiculous dates that don't make sense. And your agile team is going to be trying to run in sprints and they simply don't line up. So your, your higher management, your leadership has to get it. And luckily for us, we got it. So it was really easy for us. Inside of Microsoft, we have two different types of individuals. We have program managers and we have engineers. We do not have QA anymore. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Don't gasp. I'll explain why we don't have QA anymore. I'm not suggesting you fire all your QA people. Uh, I'll explain that why in just a second. So what we do is we take one program manager and we take about 10 engineers and we make what we call a feature team. Today we have almost 50 feature teams building Visual Studio Team Services every single day. That's 10 to 12 people per team merging into master every day. We have people in Raleigh, North Carolina, Redmond, Washington, Hyderabad, India. If you are on a team, that entire team sits together. But clearly, all 50 teams do not sit in the same building or even in the same room anywhere near each other. They're on different continents, different time zones. But if you're on one of those feature teams, you sit in a room together. Why? Because it makes the collaboration incredible. When it's time for your daily stand-up, everyone just stands up. We can see and hear everybody. You answer the three questions. What have I done since the last meeting? What am I going to get done before the next meeting? And is, is there anything stopping you? And if everything's done, you sit down, you get right back to work again. If I have a problem with your API, I don't have to find you on Slack. I don't have to schedule a meeting. I just swivel my chair around, have a conversation with you, and you and I get back to work again. If we need to have a more spirited debate, <laughs> not an argument, but a passionate discussion, you can actually leave the room, and outside of this room are two more rooms with doors on them, Right? They're not soundproof, but they're, they help with the quiet yelling. <laughs> and they have equipment inside of them, so if you do need to Skype someone who's in India, you can do that. Right? So we give you ways to collaborate with the remote teams, and we also have ways for you to have longer conversations in private if you need to. That seat that's empty is actually where the program manager normally sits. They might be off at a meeting, but even the program manager sits with the team. So that are there any questions that need to be answered, they can be answered immediately. Okay? The team stay together for about 12 to 18 months. Because if you've ever been on a long-running Agile program before, it can be monotonous, right? You're working on the same code for five years. It's just like, oh my god, I just don't want to do this anymore. So what we allow our developers to do is every 12 to 18 months, go to one of the other 50 feature teams. Maybe you're sick of writing Git source code, and you want to work on work item tracking, or you want to work on TFVC versus Git. You have that opportunity to go and switch to be fresh. And it also allows us to share the information and the knowledge throughout our teams, which is a really powerful concept as well. And again, they are completely autonomous. 
We call it aligned autonomy. They're adults, so we treat them like adults. We do not micromanage them. We do not tell them how to do their job. The one thing that we do mandate is in three weeks, we're shipping this product and your stuff better be ready to ship. If you want to use Kanban instead of a pure Agile, knock yourself out. If you want to treat it as three one-week sprints, because we have a three-week week cadence versus one three-week sprint, knock yourself out. If you prefer paired programming, test-driven development, we do not dictate that. You are adults, go be productive, but in three weeks, you better be ready to ship. So we call that aligned autonomy, okay? So how do we pick three-week sprints, which is always interesting. If you try to adopt Agile, one of the first things you need to determine is how long are your iterations going to be. They need to be anywhere from one to four weeks. Never longer than four weeks. If it's longer than four weeks, you're waterfall masquerading as a scrum team. right? Four weeks or less, how do we get the three weeks? Do you have the fairy tale here, the children's story called Goldilocks? Are you familiar with Goldilocks? Well, Goldilocks is a little girl who walks into a room and then ends up eating porridge. Some of it's too hot, some of it's too cold, some of it's just right. Well, I wasn't there when they picked three weeks. So I asked one of the individuals that was it, how did you get to three weeks? He says, we called it the Goldilocks syndrome. Like, how so? We tried four weeks. It felt too long. There was way too much estimating that was not very good. So we tried two weeks, and it felt too fast. Because if you've done Agile, there's a lot of ceremony. The daily stand-up, the sprint review, the planning, the retrospective. That's a lot of meetings. And sometimes if your sprints are too short, you feel like you're in more meetings than you are getting work done. Three weeks was that sweet spot for us, and we've been running at three weeks ever since. So it gave us enough ceremony and enough time to be productive, and that's exactly how we run. But you might notice that there's light and dark sections here, and the three weeks is only the lighter part. The darker part is our deployment. It is completely automated. It overlaps the beginning of the next sprint. We have a couple people that we peel off of those 10 to 12 individuals who basically monitor that deployment to make sure if there's any hot fixes that need to be applied, we have people who can go and address that. Because we don't want to lose a feature if something bad happens in our deployment if we don't plan for it. So we plan to have people with bandwidth to go fix those issues while the rest of the team is still delivering value. Right? So it's completely automated. If it weren't automated, we could not do this, which is a crucial portion of, of what we do here. If we were to blow up this, it looks like this. The first two days is where we take our sprint backlog, which is the selected items, and we break them down and make sure all the estimates are solid and that we believe that we can deliver on what we're doing. We sprint for three weeks, and then we're done, and that deployment starts. If everything goes right in our deployment, it takes about 10 days. Because VSTS is actually deployed in what we call rings. We practice safe deployment, which means we don't give it to everyone in the world all at once. Because you can just imagine if something bad happened, it would happen to all of our customers all at once and it would just be a nightmare. So what we do is safe deployment. We deploy it to a production environment, and we let it sit there for 24 to 48 hours, and afterwards we then deploy it to another production environment, which is a larger group of people, and we rinse and repeat until we get to our largest customers, which are the very last string. The very first string is where the Visual Studio Team Services team actually works. You never see software that we haven't tested ourselves, which is why we don't have a QA team anymore. Our manual testers simply weren't needed when we started using the products in which we were producing. Because for the first 48 hours, we have to do our actual job in the product that was just deployed using our tool set. So VSTS is actually deployed using VSTS. <coughs> which is kind of freaky because the instance that we're using deploys itself on top of itself while we're using it. Right? So go figure that one out. So how do we keep 50 feature teams all sprinting at three weeks in sync with each other? Believe it or not, we use email. At the beginning of the sprint, you get 50 emails that say, this is what my team intends to do, and here are the work items that we're going to go off and deliver. Three weeks from then, I get another email that says, this is what we got done, and here is a video that shows you us actually doing, it's like showing you the software. So you can now virtually sit inside of 50 sprint reviews, which you could never do physically if you wanted to. What's really interesting about that video is that it cannot have any Photoshop, it cannot have any special effects, it has to be real software. No tricks are involved. So if your software is not ready, it can't be in the video. What does that mean for all the developers? They have to get done before the last day of the sprint. Because we have to produce the video. A lot of you who have been on scrum teams before know what that last day of the sprint feels like. It's frantic, as everyone's like coding their butts off trying to get everything done that they possibly can so they can be in the sprint review. We don't work that way at Microsoft. You have to be done several days in advance, and we mean done done, ready to ship, 
Then the program manager sits down, records a video of that new functionality, which gives them a time to review it and see, does it really meet my expectations? Because if not, now we have a day or two to go back in and just polish it. Not finish it, but polish it so that it fits our expectations, and then we can share that video. So it was interesting, because we did not expect the video to have that effect. We just wanted to watch everyone else's sprint review. But it was kind of neat to see the side effect fall out that was our teams actually had to get done sooner than they expected to, which is really neat. So this is what the emails look like. If you've ever used TFS or VSTS, you recognize that little bottom part here. That is literally just a query out of VSTS. And if I wanted to, I can actually click on one of those links and go read the work item that they're going to see. We're completely transparent. So you can read everything. You can see the estimates. And you can go off in and make sure that you're happy with what the team's going to deliver. Three weeks from then, we get another one. And then there's a little three to five minute video of exactly the software being used so that I can see exactly how it works. And I can get an idea what my peers are working on. And that way, we can all stay in sync. Now, if you need to have an additional meetings with any of those team members, you should just go do so. Right? Again, if you treat them like adults, they'll act like adults. And that's exactly what we do inside of Microsoft. So we don't mandate that team A talk to team B. If they have relationships or they have dependencies, they're going to go talk to each other and make sure that they deliver three weeks from now. Now, how do we do our long-term planning? Because you've got to kind of have a vision of where you want to be. So what we do is we have our leadership team, which does, does anyone remember Brian Harry? I hate to say that I have to say remember. He just left, right? So he, he went on a year sabbatical. I hope he comes back. But our fearless leader now is called Nat Freeman. And Nat Freeman owns Visual Studio Team Services and TFS. And his leadership sit down and say, based on everything that we know today, in the industry, what our competitions are doing, what the trends are, where should our product be 18 months from this very moment? And they dream up what they believe 18 months in the future should look like. If we go back and look 18 months in the past, if we've only done 60% of what we thought we needed, that is a win for us. Because the world changes, the industry changes. What you thought you wanted 18 months ago definitely isn't probably what you needed 18 months into the future. And we're wise enough to understand that. So if we only hit 60% of that, we're good. What we do then is we take that and we break it down into two six-month season. Did anyone watch the Build conference that just happened? Build? No one watched Build? They told me millions of people watch Build. <laughs> I never meet anyone who's watched Build or Connect, which is really sad. Because I was in Build, so go find the videos. I, I had some fun in Build. It's a good a conference. So what we do is we have two six-month seasons. The reason I mentioned Build and Connect are those are the two conferences that bookmark our seasons. So our team says, what do we want to deliver at Build, which is a big Microsoft conference? What do we want to then deliver at Connect six months later? That's another big, giant conference. And then we start sprinting every three weeks, delivering on our goals to try to deliver our, what we want to deliver at Build and at Connect. Six months later, we rinse and repeat this exact same process. We've now learned for the last six months. We've been sprinting for the last six months. What does the industry look like now? And how has our opinion changed on what we need to be doing 18 months from this moment? And then you simply rinse and repeat this process over and over again. So there, there's ownership here. So what happens is our, our leadership owns the, the long 18-month scenario and the seasons. Our teams own these smaller sprints. And you'll notice there's something here I didn't talk about yet. <coughs> that is this plan. Every three sprints, you see there's a little plan right there, the second box. What that is, is when we have 50 feature teams, several of those feature teams are very closely related. For example, work item tracking. The Kanban board is a separate team than the backlog team. But they both work with work item tracking. The query team is a different team than those other two teams. And then we have an API team sometimes, depending on what you're working on. Those teams are clearly related to each other. And they need to be able to communicate more frequently than some of the other teams. So every three sprints, all the leads of those related teams come together and kind of have a scrum of scrums. And what I did is I got to sit in on one of these meetings when Aaron Bjork, who actually owns Work Item Tracking, had one of these meetings. I said, can I please sit in? I just kind of want to see how it works. He said, sure. He orders pizza, brings the leads into one conference room, Skyped me in, and one of the leads started talking about what they plan to do for the next nine weeks, which is the next three sprints. One of our team members is going to go off and build this new widget. This widget's going to allow X, Y, and Z to happen. One of the other leads said, hold on. That sounds very familiar. I think one of my engineers just built that widget. Why don't you go talk to them instead of you writing it yourself? Had we not had that meeting, we would have two widgets doing the exact same thing in our code base with different bugs, and everyone would be fighting fires constantly. But now, we have one widget shared across the entire team because they had the opportunity to come together and communicate. Communication is key. 
Right? You can't just put your head in the sand. You've got to talk to each other, and that's how we do it. How many of you have heard of the term code freeze? All the developers. What does code freeze mean? Please stop typing. Because <laughs> if you keep typing, you keep creating bugs. <laughs> so if you stop typing, we can go count all the bugs you have and then let you go back in and fix them. I remember those days of code freeze. And what was horrible, I didn't write any test. We were code frozen, and I went off and had a pizza party because I thought I had done something spectacular, while the poor QA team is finding bug after bug after bug. They come raining back down on top of us, and we do what we call a bug bash. You literally pay down as much of that technical debt as you can, and then you ship it. Right? That's a horrible, horrible way to write software. Because you have no idea how much technical debt you're carrying. Because you don't write any test at all, and you wait for the QA team to tell you how much technical debt you've incurred. This is an actual chart of ours. The first two peaks aren't too bad, but then where does this thing come out of nowhere, right? So if we wanted to ship, or we thought we were going to be able to ship, and then this happens, you're not shipping anymore. Your data is gone, completely blown. You're pushing. People's expectations are now upset because you had no idea how much technical debt that you had. But what if you could take the curve that looked like this and turn it into a curve that looked like that? That's what Buck Hodges, the director of engineering at Microsoft, wanted to do. So we went off and he started doing some math. And he calculated that on average, he can clear, or his teams can clear, one bug per engineer per day. Right? That was the math. So if you have five engineers, you could have five bugs, and everything is going to be OK. Because I could say, stop what you're doing, and a week from now, we'd be ready to ship. Right? So you cannot have more than five bugs per engineer per team. That was what we call our bug bar. He said, if you do this for me, I'm always one week away from shipping, and there's no more of this weird technical debt that we have to incur, because we're now paying down the technical debt. When you get that sixth bug, someone on your team stops what they're doing, pays down that technical debt, so that you guys are back where you're supposed to be. Right? It's just like financial debt. The longer you wait, the harder it is to pay off that credit card. Same thing with technical debt. So we had to stay on top of it. But to know how many bugs you're carrying, that means you have to be testing more frequently and earlier, which means we had to start unit testing. We had to have the people who actually wrote the code test the code, which is new for us. Because a lot of us were like everyone else. The people who wrote the code were not the people who were testing the code. And we had to change that. So when we did, we started creating something called a bug bar. The bug bar is something that we track very closely for each individual team. And this bug bar allows us to see how many bugs per, on average, our teams are actually carrying. I cannot stress what I'm about to say enough. Do not punish your teams for these numbers. I'm going to read that again. I'm going to repeat that. Do not punish your team for these numbers. Engineers are extremely smart people. If these numbers have to be below 5 to not get in trouble, they magically stay below 5. Right? Because no one wants to get in trouble. Right? So they'll game the system if you punish them with these numbers. But if you use these numbers to inspect and adapt, that is the core principle of, of Agile. Inspect and adapt. That's exactly what we do with these numbers. If we have a team who's struggling to stay below this bug bar, it's the leadership's fault. Why did we not empower you? Why did we not enable you? Why did we not equip you to be able to stay below that? Explain to me why you struggled so that we can go back in and fix that for you so that you don't struggle in the next sprint. Do not punish for these numbers. I simply cannot stress that enough. The next thing I want to talk about is that everything that I've said so far sounds very dev, but not very ops. Right? And that's unfortunate. But we had a lot of things that we had to do on our dev side. But we also have a scorecard for our operations. I wouldn't even call this an operations scorecard as much as an engineering scorecard. And the difference is, at Microsoft, we have a mantra. If you wrote it, you run it. You know what I mean by that? That means, back in the compact days, when I put my software on the machine, I would press enter and I would just run out of the room as fast as I could, right? <laughs> because then, if I could get out of there without being tagged, it wasn't my fault anymore. It was not my problem. So when the system is having issues at night, some other person is paying the consequences for that, right? When I sleep through the night and I wake up in the morning all rested and nice, and this poor person's hair is pulling out because it's a problem, I get a bug on my, in my in email, eh, I'll get to that tomorrow, right? That night, the same person, unfortunately, has to go through the same hell of monitoring and managing that system. But I didn't pay the consequences for my bad decisions. So how do you make a developer a good tester? You wake their asses up. <laughs> No BS. Literally, we have people wearing pagers. They're, they're essentially on call. 
So if you wrote the software and it's running inside of VSTS, someone on your team is going to get woken up if VSTS goes down because of your software. Guess what that does for the quality of your product? <laughs> quality goes through the roof because I want to sleep at night, right? So if I find out that the reason that my code caused an issue and they woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning is because I tried to cast a name as an integer and I got an exception, what am I going to do in all my methods that cast as integers? Try parse, validate the data. I'm going to go back in and try to make it bulletproof because I want to sleep through the night. So it's amazing how making the person who makes the bad decision pay the consequences for that bad decision increases the number, your quality really, really drastically. Right? So that's what we had to do. We basically got rid of our QA team because another issue that we're having with our developers, when you're not worrying about testing the code, the way that you write your code is drastically different. Has anyone actually practiced test-driven development? It's extremely difficult. But the code that you wrote looked nothing like you expected it to look. If I had written the code without writing the test, it would look drastically different than having the test first. It kind of dictates the way that you write the code. A lot of people think that test-driven development is a testing practice. It's not. It's actually a design pattern. And then when you understand that, you realize that you're actually baking the quality into the product. So why am I talking about this? Buck Hodges, again, was wondering why on one of our sprints it was taking so long for our automation engineers who were writing the automated UI test to write the test and get them back to us. It said because it's hard to get into all the nooks and crannies of the code because of the way that the code was written. So why don't you just go in and fix it then? So that's not our responsibility. So we got to fix that then. Because if the person who wrote the code was responsible for testing the code and found it hard to test, they would simply rewrite the code to make it easier to test. So why aren't you doing that? So that's, that's it. Our automation engineers and our developers are now one person. If you write the code, you test the code. And then people always say, well, when you get rid of QA, how did you make them good testers? I just told you, you wake them up. Right? So when we wake them up, all of a sudden the quality got really, really good in our products. So it's really important to understand that. And the reason that we got rid of our manual testers is because of the way that we actually used VSTS to build VSTS. So we are our own first line of manual testers as well. But this is an engineering scorecard owned by ops and developers. And on this scorecard, what we're trying to do is measure how many times did our system go down? How long was it down? How many people were impacted? How long did it take us to detect that it was down? Was it our telemetry or an email from our individuals? Because not only our ops team, but our developers, our engineers are responsible for that software running. So this is not punishing devs versus punishing ops. This is the entire team being held responsible. And again, we do not punish for these numbers. We find the red ones and we try to make them yellow. We try the yellow ones and we try to make them green. It's all about in inspecting and adapting what you're doing here. But we learn about all this kind of things. We try to mitigate a problem, which means get the system back up and running. But you have to do it in such a way that you don't corrupt the crime scene. Because if you do, you can't just go reboot the server. If you reboot the server, what have you just guaranteed? That it will happen again. Because you didn't fix anything. Right? Eventually, you will run out of memory again. You will run out of disk space again. Whatever the problem was that caused you to reboot that server, you didn't fix it by rebooting the server. Your software has to be fixed. So what we do is we call root cause analysis. We go in and we find out exactly what caused that problem. And we even publicly document this in a blog post that says, this is what went wrong in our system. This is how we're going to fix it to make sure it never happens to you again. But that is what we grade here on our engineering scorecard. Now let's talk about some of the fundamental changes that we had to make. We went from a multi-year cycle to what we call at Microsoft Cloud Cadence, which is moving as fast as you possibly can. Now that we actually have Windows containers available to us, we're even going to be able to move faster than we did before. I said that we ship every three weeks. That's true and also not true. We do ship every three weeks like clockwork, but we also ship multiple times a day that we just don't brag about. Hot fixes, performance improvement, bug fixes go out every single day to our product. So we're not just a company that went from shipping every three years to shipping every three weeks. We went from a company shipping every three years to shipping every day. Right? It's just every three weeks we wake up and say, here are all the cool new features. Throughout that three-week period, we're constantly putting out performance improvements, bug fixes, and things like that. We went from a box product to a live site product, which was drastically different. We went from stamping CDs that we ship to you in your MSDN boxes to actually running a system 24 by 7. There's never ever an op opportunity for us to take it offline. No matter where you are in the world, someone it's work time for them. right? 
It's business time 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we cannot take the system down to upgrade it. We can't take the system down to patch it. Everything has to happen while the system is running. I doubt many of our pieces of software, had we not thought about it, could be upgraded while the software is running. Most software is designed to be stopped, upgraded, and started again. So don't believe to move at the speed that you want to move, it's just getting tools in place. Or just reading the DevOps books and saying, now we're DevOps. No, you might have to re-architect your software to allow you to move at the pace in which you want to move. We had to do that with our, our contracts for our web services. If I'm a web service and I depend on you, and you're a web service and you depend on him, chances are you have to be deployed, then you get deployed, and then I get deployed, right? Because of the dependency chain. That just complicated our deployment. Because not only do all three of us have to be deployed, but we have to be deployed in a certain order. If that order is violated, our system could go down. But wouldn't it be nice that all three of us depend on each other in the same way, but we can de be deployed in any order that we want? I can go first, you can go second, you can go last, and the system still works. That's exactly how our web services work today. Doesn't matter our dependency chain, we can be deployed in any order that we want, and the system at runtime determines on what versions of each other we're supposed to be using, and never goes down and never fails, and when we're all at the right version, we all start humming at the same tune using the latest version of everything. We had to change the way that we write our microservices to be able to do that. You don't just start randomly <laughs> deploying your microservices in any order, right, and hope for the best. Sometimes you have to change your architecture to move at the speed in which you want to move, so please don't forget that. We took our dev and our QA and just told you about that just a second ago. We combined them into one person. That allowed us to make sure that the quality was actually designed into the product and not bolted onto the product later. Okay? It also allowed us to go a lot further. This is truly shifting left. Our quality was much higher on the outside because on the inside we were doing a lot better data, a lot better testing. We used to have functional testing, the automated UI test. We had 27,000 of them. Not once in history did they ever all pass. <laughs> Not once. So does any developer care? <laughs> right? If you know some are always going to fail, who's watching that signal? No one watches that signal because we know that there's always going to be some that fail. I don't know if it's a new failure or an old failure because I never watch it anyway. And they take forever to run and they're hard to write and even harder to maintain. We had to fix that. So how do you fix it? You go to unit test instead. Unit tests are fast, they're easy to write, and they're really, really reliable when written correctly. So we went from having 27,000 UI automation tests to running over 70,000 unit tests in under seven minutes on every pull request, which we do 600 times a day. Right? So we went from just amazing amounts of code coverage. But again, if you are a new developer and you double click on the on click button and then you go to the on click method and you write in there, the only way to get to that code is to click the button, which means it requires automation. But if you take the code out, put it in a class library, and then call the class library from the on click, you can now test that piece of code. Again, we had to re-architect what we did to be able to move at the speed in which we wanted to move. We can never take it down, which again meant we had to go back in and figure out ways to deploy our database changes while the application is being used. Deploying our UI changes while the application is being used. The worst case scenario is that you are on one of the instances that we're updating, Something that used to take three milliseconds will now take a second. But you will not get an error. You will not have to retry it. Everything should happen just the way that it's supposed to every single time. Again, lots of engineering goes into this. I have some resources I'll share with you at the end where I sit down with the people who maintain this and talk to them about how they actually did it. Right? Because in 45 minutes, I could never go into that. One of my favorite topics to talk about is feature flags, also known as feature toggles. Has anyone, anyone heard of those topics? Feature flags, feature toggles, okay. Uh, for those who have not heard of them before, they are an advanced technique that allows us to never have to roll back our system. So how do you push out code that doesn't work quite the way that you want it to and not have to roll it back? What you do is you put behind, you put a feature flag, which is basically an if statement that says, run this code until I tell you otherwise to run this other code. So it's running this code over here, and it was like, okay, we want to try the new code, turn on the switch, and we turn it on, all hell breaks loose, like, oh no, turn off the switch, and then boom. Everything's fixed again. Right? We didn't have to roll back anything. The code is still there in production. You just can't reach it anymore. If you're doing Agile and you're struggling to get a work done in an entire sprint, what most people do is they'll create a branch. And that branch will live as long as that feature needs to be around before they finish it. And then they merge it back into master two months later and you have a merge bomb. Right? <laughs> Everything explodes because all the code is actually changed. But what if I could merge into master every single day? no matter what. And that's what feature flags enable you. Because the code doesn't have to be done, it just has to be able to compile. 
And if it can compile, you can go ahead and merge it into master because no one's going to reach it anyway until the flag gets turned back on. So we use feature flags not only for that, but we also use feature flags to allow us to do those big six month events. So at build, half the stuff that we wanted to show you was in build months before the event happened. We just had the feature flags off so that you guys couldn't see it. And then when Scott Guthrie gets on stage and says, I'm announcing AKS, blah, 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 then all of a sudden we turn on the flag and the whole world gets to see this cool new feature. But we've been testing it and using it internally for months because we can turn on flags for individuals, for regions, for companies. You don't have to turn them on and off wholesale like we used to in the past. Okay? So I am extremely, extremely active on Twitter. It is the number one way to get a hold of me. This is my team. Most people call us the league. And if you want to get a hold of us, you can actually use that hashtag right there. If you use that hashtag in your tweet, a room inside of team rooms lights up and lets us know. It's sort of like a, like a bat signal in Batman. <laughs> <laughs> if you use that tweet, this entire team, and we have developers on this team, we have operations. She is a Kubernetes genius, right? So if you want to do Helm, Brigade, Kubernetes, Docker, she's your girl. She's amazing. This is our Windows Sys admin. So if you're doing stuff with PowerShell and Chef and Puppet, that's my PowerShell guy. And then these are two of the best developers I've ever met. And then there's me in the middle who was smart enough to get them all together and form a team out of them. So if you need our help implementing DevOps in your company using not only Microsoft products, but if you want to use Jenkins to get to Azure, we're okay with that. Right? I don't make fun of Jenkins anymore. Right? <laughs> as long as your target is Azure, I'm on your side. Right? <laughs> so some more resources I want you to have here is that uh, we do a lot of shows on Channel 9. Some of you might have seen me on Channel 9 before because I'm on there as often as I can to help share some of the DevOps goodness that we do here at Microsoft. Now, if you want to learn how we do safe deployment, if you want to learn how we keep our teams consistent across 50 different feature teams, there's a show called DevOps Interviews on Channel 9. Anything that has Manil Shaw in it or Aaron Bjork, watch those shows. They're my most popular guest every single time they're on there. I think they've all been on, they've both been on there three times a piece already. And every one of their shows is just amazing. We go right into the weeds of how we implement some of this stuff. I talked to the Windows team, who was our biggest customer, with a Git repository of 350 gigabytes. Their Git repository is so large, we had to invent a file system just so that you could clone it, right? Because when you wanted to do a Git status, what should that take? A couple nanoseconds, millisecond maybe? It took three minutes to do a git status on the git repo the repository for Windows. But I actually sit down and talk to the person who talks about how we did that internally at Microsoft. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can do that. That's why we bought Git, right? Uh, oh, why we bought GitHub. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the DevOps Lab show, this is like theory sitting down with thought leaders and, and having a thoughtful conversation. These are much shorter, and they're about how do we fix a problem. So we'll have a guest come on with a particular problem, and then show you the solution for it as well. Then there's a Visual Studio Toolbox for a lot of cool, studio, cool new stuff for Visual Studio and VSTS. And then we have the Azure Friday, which I'm a co-host. So that is Scott Hanselman's show. So if you know Scott Hanselman, that is his show. I am just a guest host that comes on there every once in a while. Again, on Twitter, the number one way to get a hold of me, I'm, I'll read that before I read my email, uh, because the questions are short and to the point. Uh, an email is long and verbose and drives me nuts. Uh, and again, if you need my team, please just use this hashtag. I am out of time, but thank you so much for having me, everyone. Appreciate it. You say, you say that you have a lot of adults in, in your team and uh, you treat the people like a, a grow up people. And uh, my ask is, Today I have a team and I have a lot of trouble with this kind of co uh, behavior because the people cannot, can, how can I say, don't get the, the, the urgency and the importance about the testing and unit test and put the, shit, the, the, put the, the things in prod, production and take care of this. How can I do this? How, and uh, what do you do, what you did inside on Microsoft to take the best people to work with you or to change the culture uh, is, is really difficult to me today to achieve this goal because I have a lot of people that I need to convince him that the, the better way is... Sure. So okay. the question is about the people, the culture. How do you change that? It is simply the hardest part of the entire equation. The products, everyone has products. The process, there's books on how to do this. But the people have to get it. 
right? And that has been the toughest part in a lot of places. I've had the most success, as I described early on, when your leadership gets it, right? Because if your CEO says, we're going to be an agile team, it doesn't matter what the 30-year-old guy who doesn't want to ever do this again wants to say, because you can now put pressure upon them to do the right thing because your CEO said so, right? The other thing is to bring in a scrum master who's done this already. What I mean by that is if I take this poor gentleman and I sip him off to be certified and he comes back to a team of 30-year veterans who have been doing it waterfall for their entire career and you come back and say, we're going to do daily stand-ups, they're going to say, no, we're not, right? And you're going to be like, okay, maybe we don't need them, right? And you're going, to you're going to talk yourself out of doing the right thing just to make your team happy. I will not do that, right? I will come in and say, we're going to be doing daily stand-ups. And if they say no, I'm like, yes, we are, right? Because that's simply the way that this is going to go forward. Going, and I have the authority, because I'm an outsider, believe it or not, uh, even though you work there, you can say the same things that I say. But when I come in as an outsider and say the exact same words, they have this entirely new power to them because I'm the hired consultant or some crap like that, right? It's nonsense, but it works. The other thing is, is that when you get challenged as a new Scrum Master and you've never done it before, you're, you're easily convinced not to do it the right way. But when I've been doing it, my gosh, 10 years, 12 years I've been a certified Scrum Master, I've gone into organization after organization and been successful, you're not going to tell me that you're not going to do this right. And you're not going to be able to convince me that what you say is right, because I've already done this before. And I actually have a track record that proves that what I'm saying is real. So what I would do in those scenarios is literally hire a outside Scrum Master who is battle-worn, <laughs> right? Who has done this and can stand up to those people who are going to, because you're going to get it everywhere. I get it at every company that I go to. And I go in and I very clearly say that what we're about to do is not going to be easy. Transitioning from waterfall to agile, it's going to hurt. And at times it's going to hurt a lot. But when I'm done with you, you're going to be thanking me for what I've done. Because once you've worked on a highly functioning scrum team, you will never go back. There is no better way to work than on a team who can deliver every three weeks on their promises. Are you kidding me? High quality software that's truly done when you say that it's done, it's an amazing, empowering experience. And the passion that you feel for me right now, that's exactly what I put on every organization that I go and visit. So if you can't talk with that passion and that authority, you're always going to struggle. Because I'm the same way as anyone else. I don't want to change. I got to go learn Python now? Seriously? You know how many languages I already know? Freaking out. I'm like so sick of learning languages. So I, I, no one wants change, even if the change is for the better. No one wants to change. You want to keep doing it the way that they've been doing it. So you need almost that bigger, more dominant force to come in and say, no, trust me. I get emails to this very day. It kind of makes me emotional sometimes from people I visited years ago thanking me for coming. Right? And being the asshole that I had to be at that time to make them get it. Right? But you've got to go in there, you've got to be passionate, you've got to believe in it. Right? I have some books. On, if you go to DonovanBrown.com where I blog, I have three books. Just search for Scrum and you'll see there's a list of three books that I tell everyone to read. What I mean by that is the first book, everyone on your team needs to read that book. doesn't matter what role they play. Not just a Scrum Master, but everybody. The program manager, the higher ups, everyone needs to read the first book to kind of get the lay of the land. The other two books, the Scrum Master needs to read those other two books. Because one of them is about a Scrum Master learning the hard way about what works, what doesn't work, and gives you a lot of cool ideas that you can try in your organizations to be successful as well. So hire a Scrum Master. That, that is my number one best advice. And then once he's done or she's done, then you can put anyone in there. Because that team will refuse to go back to the way they used to work. Right? I've literally had one team shape another Scrum Master for me. Because I left them, they were perfect, and the Scrum Master came in and wasn't doing their job. Like, uh-uh, that's not how we work. And taught that Scrum Master how to be a good Scrum Master. Right? Very powerful. Go ahead. You said about aligned autonomy. So yes. Are the teams allowed to use uh, Kanban instead of Scrum, for instance? So the question is, you said that you're allowed to use al aligned autonomy. And are the teams allowed to use Kanban versus Scrum? The answer is absolutely yes. Right? So we trained everyone. So we all know the, how to communicate to each other. So if you're still using Kanban internally, that's fine. But you know what we're, the rest of the teams are talking. Right? And you know how to communicate with this because you've been educated on how we're going to be doing Scrum. But we do have teams that are doing more of a pool model, Kanban pure, without Scrum involved. But again, their three-week boundary, that's where we all got to come to say, hey, did you deliver? Did you not deliver? And everyone's been delivering for years now. So absolutely. Uh, One more and then I'll come back. Okay. Uh, I saw a, a, a common problem in most of, most of my clients. When they see a burn a burnout chart, uh, uh, they, they often see uh, uh, something going down, uh, not never on the perfect line, <laughs> of course, <laughs> ne never on the perfect line, or they, they go uh, up for, for the entire, yes, uh, yes, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, you said that uh, the free week sprint uh, works 
for uh, sim simply works for you because yeah. it, it fe feels right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, you're not uh, uh, doing most of your job at the end of the sprint, like you're like you're sure. squeezing the toothpaste. Sure. So, <laughs> good analogy. So how do you sell to your managers? How, how that how, how that worked uh, when when you tell them, look, we are delivering now. So, uh, are you spending the rest of the time idle? So Got it. Okay. So it's about. First of all, being transparent, and it's also about education, right? So one of the things that I do, if, if say for example, in my old days when I was coming in to be a, a process consultant, I was going to be your scrum master, I'd walk in and I'd say, okay, I need to know, I need to see everyone on my team, so I need to know everyone who's going to be on my team, and I need to see everyone who interacts with my team. What I mean by that is I need to know every stakeholder, I need to know the product owner, I need to know everyone. I need them all in a room right now. And I would get everyone who's even going to talk to my team in one room and then I would educate the entire team. The reason that they're concerned about the burn down is because they don't understand how to read it. Right? And that's the problem. It's education is the key. If you educate them on what that burn down actually means, then all of a sudden they're not frightened by it. They're not confused by why aren't we shipping every single day or every I, I see the items done, but why aren't you shipping it then if you're not waiting until three weeks to ship? Those kind of questions, right? It's because the people who are asking those questions haven't been educated on how this process is supposed to work. So it's important that you don't just educate yourself. You don't just educate your team. You literally educate everyone who is going to talk to your team. Everyone has to know. Because if they're expecting Gantt charts and burn, I mean, Gantt charts and, and those type of milestones from a waterfall mindset, they're never going to get that from an Agile team. And if they don't understand it, they're going to resist it. And they're going to start insisting that things go back the way that they understand and that they're comfortable with. So the step number one is educate everybody. Now, your burn down not burning down accurately, that's a developer issue, right? Because I used to be a horrible, horrible at that. Every Friday, I would go in and I would zero out anything that I had done. But if it wasn't done, I left it whatever the number was, right? So my burn downs always went like this. Every Friday, you'd get a big drop. There's nothing you can do with that data. But I didn't know I was being a bad team member because I'd never been a scrum master before. When I started becoming a scrum master and seeing those stair steps and realizing how useless this information is to me, I became very diligent about making sure every day you need to go in every single day and update your work remaining for me so that I can actually see it burn down. It might burn up. That's OK. But now I know. And I don't have to wait till Friday to figure this stuff out. And you'll also get, when you get better, when you get better um, burn downs, then it's going to be easier for you to communicate that information to your users. But the key to your problem is education. Educate everybody. Make sense? Makes perfect. Good. And there was one more question. Yeah, so it's about the three weeks release cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always new features to ship, or, is fi or, or, or sometimes it's just hot fixes and fix bugs. I'm, I'm wondering, you have a, a three-week release cycle. So I think that's, that, that comes a time where no new feature is around, or it's every day you have new stuff to add to your software. It doesn't, it doesn't become like a big monster software <laughs> because of all those new features from three weeks. Our backlog is public. You can go see it. Trust me, we will be adding features till I leave Microsoft, right? There is no shortage But are of those features. features useful? Because, I mean, sometimes just to have something to release, you know? No, I got it. No, so we, we have never said, everyone must have something to, to release, so go make up some idea, right? We have no shortage of, we, we use something called um, user voice. I don't know if you're familiar with the website called User Voice. User Voice is a public website where anyone can go and say, I wish that Visual Studio Team Services did this. And then you can get all your friends to go vote on it. And if it gets high enough, it will literally end up on our product backlog for the VSTS team, right? And we get tons of information from there. 18 month vision, remember, we look 18 months in the future. That's 18 months worth of features and improvements that we want in our product. So a three week sprint. Trust me, over 18 month period, we're going to constantly be adding stuff. We add improvements to Git every single sprint. We figure out ways to make our user interface more intuitive. We try to make performance improvements. So we have, I have never known a team to be like, you know what? I have no idea what I'm going to do for the next three weeks. Never once ever. <laughs> we're constantly like, holy crap, how will we ever catch up with this, this constant request for new features, which is coming all the time. But it's not only new features, it's bug fixes too. Those usually go out every single day, right? So you're absolutely right. So we do have bug fixes and hot fixes. That stuff, performance improvements, that goes out every day, 
right? Those are constantly being deployed. What we do every three weeks is we want to have a way that we can announce all the new features, right? Because if we did it every single day, you'd never keep up. I can barely keep up with the three week cadence, right? There are features in that product that I just stumble across. I'm like, holy crap, I didn't know we had this. This is awesome. And then I'll go tweet that, did you know that we could do this? Like, yeah, it's been in there for, for sprints. So what we try to do is like take three weeks as that point where you can look up and say, okay, what's new? Because if you had to look every day on what's new on VSTS, it would be, be unbearable. So that three-week cadence is about what are we going to deliver as new functionality, new features, and things like that. But you're absolutely right. Every single day, there's bug fixes or performance improvements that we put out every single day. Does that answer the question for you? Yeah, sure. Okay, good.